right, it is 3 o'clock Eastern Time, and so I would like to get going. Uh, and we've got the recording on, so the session will be recorded, and that is actually going now. So, Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Sue Ostoff, and I'm with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Outed Women here in cloudy Philadelphia. And I'll be your host for today's webinar. And before we begin the presentation, I have to go over some logistics. And like I was saying uh, earlier, some of you have uh, been in webinars through iLink before, so you know the drill. So if you want to go get a cup of coffee or tea, now is a good time to do it. But if you're having some technical difficulties or you're new to this, I really encourage you to stay around. Um, if you're disconnected at any time, just go back to that original email you got early this morning and click on the link again to log back in. And if you're having any problems getting back on, call iLink support. You might want to write this number down. It's 800-799-4510. And Katita, um, thank you. She put that in the chat box, which is in the lower left-hand corner. And I have two assistants working with me today, and it's Katita Cavero, who just put that in, and Dot Goldberger. So thanks to both of them for helping out. And uh, I just mentioned the chat box, and you'll find that in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And to use it, just put your cursor in the white rectangle on the bottom, click in there, and then enter your text and hit, hit the Enter key. So why don't we all try it now? So if go down to the public chat box in the lower left-hand corner, and let us know where you're joining from. So if, you know, just if you put, your name should come up automatically. And if you just put where you're joining us, and if you have more than one person there, can, um, can you, <laughs> I saw that somebody at, is also in Philly, but it's sunny. It was sunny. It doesn't look sunny from my office um, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you could also let us know if there's more than one person at your site, that would be very helpful. So welcome to all of you. You can see there's people from around the country here. So great. Welcome. Um, as I think most of you know, all the participants are muted. So we're going to be using that chat feature for any questions, problems, or comments. And during the webinar, we'll be collecting pre uh, questions down in the chat box. And I will also acknowledge when I see your question so you know that I got it. And we'll be asking our presenters some of the questions as we go along through the presentation. And then we'll pose as many of the other questions um, that we didn't get to, as many as we can at the end of their presentation. So we'll do questions both during and at the end of the presentation. Uh, technical problems, call iLink support, 800-799-4510. And again, you can put questions in the chat box. If you're joining us only by phone today, you can email me with any questions. And that's at sueo, S-U-E-O, at ncdbw.org. And then either I or one of my coworkers will do the best to get back to you. And no sense putting that in the chat box if they're only on the phone. So it's sueo at ncdbw.org. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and we will post it on our website. And that will be hopefully up there in about a week or 10 days. And that's at ncdbw.org. <coughs> um, we've also posted today's PowerPoint, which is in a version that you should be able to save and print the presenter's bios and copies of the case scenarios on Google Docs. Some people have trouble getting on there. If they're using Internet Explorer, usually uh, Google Chrome works better. Uh, so Katito just put the link back up there. So you do not need any of that information at all uh, for today's presentation. Uh, shortly after the webinar is over, I will send you an email that will contain a confirmation of your attendance. It will also uh, have a link to our website and includes a very brief survey that also pops up at the very end of the webinar. So it would be great if you would fill it out. It really would take about two minutes or even less, and it's just very helpful information for us as we plan future webinars and for our speakers. So if you could do that, we'd really appreciate that. So what would we'd like to do now, actually, is go and ask some questions to, of who's on the webinar. So I'm glad some more people have joined us. 
So if you can actually look there on your screen, and those of you who are signed in, um, Doc, can you confirm that you're seeing the questions, please? OK. All right. So if you can all go ahead and tell us who you are by literally clicking on the dot on your screen. So if you answer other in question one or question four, um, then you can put in the chat box over there um, who you are, OK? Uh, so question one is, how do you describe your profession? So if you can let us know, that would be really helpful. I'm putting in the share results so you can see. Question number two is uh, whether or not you've participated as an expert witness in an immigration case. And there's, uh, it's OK to check more than one. Uh, also, whether or not you're an OV grantee. And then if you are an OV grantee, OVW, sorry, grantee, if you can tell us what kind of grantee you are, that would be really helpful. I see some people are having problems seeing the PowerPoint. Right now, we're, the PowerPoint is not up. It's a question. So we're going to go back to the PowerPoint in just another minute. I just am trying to see whether or not anybody um, hasn't yet filled this out. If you could, just click right directly on the screen. And Noel and Edna, you're seeing the answers there that we have 15% community-based advocates and then 11% clinician social workers or therapists. Yep, I'm seeing yeah, them. Yeah, you're seeing that. Yep. And then you're seeing overwhelmingly people have not participated as an expert witness in immigration cases, but 2% yes. have. Um, and again, this is a total, these are percentage of the, all the people who are on, of the 58 people who signed it in. Um, OK, so some people are having some trouble here. So OK, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. OK. <clears throat> so right now, I have gone back to the presentation, and I'm hoping you're seeing the presenter's bios. OK, so that's what's up now. And for those of you who just joined or just recently joined, I'm Sue Ostoff with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. And I really want to extend a warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us. This is the sixth in our series of webinars about expert witnesses in cases that involve survivors of battering, sexual assault, and other forms of trauma. And if you missed the first five webinars in this series, recordings, and as I mentioned, that recordings that will pull up copies of the PowerPoints once you start listening to it, are posted on our website. And once you get to our website, then go to resources and scroll on down, and you'll see the recordings. And um, Katita, if you could put that information, our website information, back in the chat box. Again, the, all participants are muted, and we'll collect questions during the presentation. And time allowing, we will ask as many as we can to the presenters during and at the end of their presentation. Before I go any further, I really want to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for the support of this project on expert witnesses. We just think it's so great and so important that they're supporting work about expert witnessing. And so many thanks to OVW. And as you're probably aware, today's webinar is titled Understanding the Role of Expert in Immigration Proceedings Involving Victims of Battering. And we really want to acknowledge Debbie Tucker and the National Center on Domestic and Sexual Violence because it was at one of her expert witness trainings that my coworkers heard today's speakers talk about today's topic. And they came back to Philadelphia and said, oh my god, those two are so good together. You really, We should really figure out a way to get more people to be able to hear what they have to say. Um, Noelle Bush, I've known Noelle as Noelle Bush. And she said, it's OK that I only use that part of her name, because uh, that's how I know her, who is one of our speakers. And the University of Texas uh, School of Social Work have partnered with the National Center on domestic and sexual violence for over 10 years now to offer this expert witness training that they do in Austin every other year. And Edna Young, our other speaker, has been a guest presenter at that training on several occasions. So without further ado, I do want to move on and um, just say what a pleasure it is to be able to introduce our two speakers today. And uh, in the interest of time, we really want to keep the introduction short. So we put up the full bios on the screen here, and they're also in the handouts. And it's, I apologize for the small text here. Um, 
And as I said, it's, it's hard to do brief introductions because these two women are so experienced. Uh, they're such a great team because one of them, Edna, is an attorney, and she represents immigrant women. And the other, Noelle, among other things, is an expert witness who has been involved in numerous immigration cases. So they really bring a wealth of well relevant experience to our topic today. And as I said, that Edna um, is an attorney, and she's a general counsel for American Gateways, which was formerly called the Political Asylum Project of Austin. And in this um, job, she, is the, she directs the legal services for the agency. She represents indigent, indigent immigrants before the Immigration Service, the Immigration Court, and in federal court. Additionally, she conducts training sessions in Texas and nationally about how to work with and provide services to immigrants in the community. She also organizes outreach and educational sessions for immigrant members of the community. Noelle Bush has done a ton of work over the past 20 years working to end interpersonal violence. Currently, she is a professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin and is the Associate Dean of Research and Director of the Center for Social Work Research. Her areas of specialization are interpersonal violence, refugees, asylees, and victims of human trafficking, as well as international social work. She is regularly called as an expert witness in criminal, civil, and immigration cases and directs a national training and directs a national training that I mentioned earlier with Debbie Tucker on this topic. Um, and we here in Philadelphia are very grateful for the work that both of them do. Uh, so they have so much valuable experience. I want to turn it over to them. Again, if you have any uh, problems, try calling iLink support 800-799-4510. Uh, and if you have any other questions, put them in the uh, chat box. And those of you who are only called in, you can email me at suo at ncdbw.org. So sorry for the long introduction. Thank you for your patience. And thank you so much, Edna and Noel, for all your great work and for your willingness to share it with us today. So it's with great pleasure that I turn this presentation over to the two of you. Thanks, Sue O. Oh. And I, this is Noelle, and I'm going to start out, and then I'm going to hand the presentation over to Edna. And I have to tell you, there's a for all of you that are on from all over the country, there's a love fest going on. Um, I've been a huge fan of the National Clearing House for the Defense of Battered Women for many, many years since I started my career 20 years ago in South Carolina, uh, working with incarcerated battered women who had killed and um, their abusers and trying to seek some relief for them. Um, and so I have been following the work, um, their work for many, many years um, and cut my teeth, if you will. Um, and so I'm big fans of theirs. So we've got a big love fest going on. And um, not only did um, Cindine come to our training, but we actually roped her into being a trainer last time she came. <laughs> so. Um, so we uh, have a big debt to owe them too, and we're delighted to be on. Um, I'm going to get into it because we have um, quite a dense um, bit of information to share with you all. And what I'm going to start with saying is the reason I think that nationally we're talking about the use of experts in general and very specifically about the use of experts in cases which involve immigrant victims of intimate partner violence or family violence or domestic violence is because generally courts uh, do not understand uh, intimate partner violence. I'm going to give a quick uh, demonstration of that. Um, I was glad to see that there are a lot of uh, advocates and social workers in particular, and then I the slide moved before I got to write down um, percentages of other people on the call. but. Um, my brother, who I love dearly and is a good human being, um, is a civil engineer. And I have no opinion about uh, civil engineering and how to build a bridge. Um, but he, ha he would probably have an opinion about my expertise, which is domestic violence. And that's what we generally know about the public. People have an opinion about the things that we do on an everyday basis. 
And so part of the reason that we use expert in, experts in cases um, is to help the court or the courts understand um, knowledge that is beyond the average person. And so I'm referring now to the slide I hope that is in front of you. Um, experts actually give the courts uh, knowledge that's beyond what the average person knows. And Edna is going to go back and talk about this from the legal perspective, but as a potential expert in an immigration case, what you need to know is that um, although you and I might understand domestic violence, um, the judge, um, the immigration judge, or whoever you're sitting before um, or writing a report for, might not well understand the issues before him or her. And so the good news is that advocates can help that court understand the context of intimate partner violence. And this is, these are the federal rules in front of you, um, Dalbert, and the rules of evidence 702 and um, that actually give us the, uh, allow us to speak in court as experts. So I'm actually not going to say much more than this about this particular slide because Edna's going to go back to it. I will tell you I have a general rule about uh, who I am as a social worker because even with that inter introduction, I think of myself primarily as a social worker. Um, <clears throat> and I try not to be a lawyer. I'm a better expert when I'm a social worker who knows my scope of work. Um, and having said that, I need to be a social worker um, or an advocate, um, for that matter, who understands um, how I interface, uh, particularly in these cases, as an expert. So that's why we give you this particular slide so you know um, why and how you get to testify in a court of law. So we'll go back to this um, in just a bit. So um, just as a brief overview, um, you know, what is your role as an expert? You really are to inform the trier of fact, whoever that trier of fact is, and we're going to talk or break down that idea a little bit because you might be speaking to a different trier of fact depending on what kind of case you're engaged in. Um, <clears throat> and it's really important to um, highlight the ways in which domestic violence, in this case intimate partner violence, is misunderstood generally. It's also really important that you um, give an opinion, a professional opinion, that is based on um, what you know as an advocate, what you know experientially, what you know from the literature, what you know from the evidence which you have considered from that case, and that you're able to lay that out in a very logical way. What the research shows on the use of experts in court is that judges will dismiss, the trier of fact will dismiss um, the testimony of an expert if they consider the expert testimony to be biased. Um, and so it's really important that you provide as an expert an informed, professional, unbiased opinion. Now, that doesn't, unbiased doesn't actually mean that you don't make a statement about what has happened in the case. It just means that you consider all the evidence, which in some cases might be alternative explanations um, to um, why a behavior has occurred. And that alternative explanation um, can look lots of different ways. And we'll talk about what that means in, in the case and what some of the challenges that I face as an expert. OK. Um, so what, what gets you qualified as an expert? Um, you will have to be qualified as an expert. And that's done in a variety of ways. Um, I probably should back up and say that one of the ways that you will be uh, engaged is through, I hope, a very professional immigration attorney who will at some point in his or her case understand that they need an expert to help the trier fact understand 
pieces of this case that are complicated. Um, and so they'll hopefully call you or email you and say, I need you to help me with an assessment that looks like X, Y, and Z, and they'll have some ideas of that. Um, but one of the things that you'll have to do is be qualified as an expert. And you can be qualified on the basis of your direct practice experience, your education, your training, your research. Um, so you will need to keep up with your resume or your CV and everything that you've done that would uh, legitimize who you are. So for instance, I hope that at the end of this webinar you will put on, this, on your resume that you've attended this training um, so that you can um, qualify yourself as, I know how to be an ethical expert witness. I've sort of been vetted in um, understanding my role as an expert. Um, so you would add this to your um, resume, for example. Um, typically, when I work, when we do our national training, um, we talk a lot with advocates who might not have the advanced degrees, but are actually incredibly effective experts based on how many clients they've seen, uh, how many years they've worked in the field. And so the lawyer that, that originally engages you will talk with you about how, how you qualify in a particular case. Um, what you want to do is state your credentials and not overstate your credentials. And it's really important that you have that balance. Um, you don't want to undermine yourself and you don't want to overstate uh, wh what you know. Um, so you want to talk with the attorney about how to do that. And you may have to, um, often in immigration cases, I don't think there's any that I haven't submitted my resume beforehand, and that actually is part of the documentation that, that uh, goes in to qualify me. I'm going to let <clears throat> Edna jump in if I miss pieces here, too. <clears throat> so. The other thing that happens um, in immigration cases that um, are similar to other domestic violence cases is um, elements that may be confusing to the general public. And as you and I know, um, we often get this question asked, why didn't she just leave or why did she stay? And we might not believe that that's a legitimate question and we might have people ask alternative questions about why is the offender abusing? Um, and I believe in that dialogue and I believe in changing that narrative. And what I've come to learn over about 10 years now of uh, being engaged as an expert is um, I'm a better expert when I actually uh, take this question on head on. Uh, because this is what the judge is thinking about, and when I'm in front of a jury, this is what the jury's thinking about. Um, so I challenge this question often in the classroom, in my training sessions, but when I've got somebody's, um, quite literally, when I've got their future, I'm part of the what happens to them in the future, um, I don't take that on. Um, I just take, I don't take on um, trying to redirect the narrative is what I mean about that. Um, I just take on trying to help them understand this question. And so in this, these two examples, and I'll let you read those um, two examples, I give you the ways in which I answer those questions. These are, we lifted these, Edna and I lifted these from two cases that we've worked on together, uh, reports that I've done. Um, where I'm trying to convey to the court that it's not easy to leave, that it's a complicated decision when somebody's being abused in a relationship, that leaving doesn't mean that the abuse is going to end, that physical violence is not the only tactic that's used, um, that <clears throat> physical violence is often used intermittently, at best often, 
And so what I'm trying to do here as an expert is give the answer to the question that the judge or in some cases, um, in my criminal cases, the jury is asking. Give them the answers to those questions because that's what's going through their mind and if you don't answer those questions, my experience is that um, you're not doing um, the case much good. So um, again, we need to take on changing the cultural narrative around why do we ask these questions um, in a different context. But when I'm, you know, sort of on the hot seat, if you will, um, I'm not going to take those on in front of a judge in an immigration court. I'm just going to answer those. And you know, as an as a um, I learned this from Edna Yang and from really good immigration attorneys. I usually say things like, let me give you five reasons this client didn't just leave. And then I will list them. Um, she didn't leave because she had no money to leave. Quite literally, she didn't know where she was in the United States. Um, she didn't know um, when she walked out her door what would happen to her. So I'm talking about the isolation, right? So that's my direct testimony when I'm in court on the stand. And then typically I'm doing two things in immigration cases. I'm testifying directly, but I'm also giving what you see here in front of you as um, a report to the court. And Noelle, if I can just add, um, this is Edna. I think it's important to also mention, and we will be discussing this when we a little bit further on in the actual presentation when we talk about uh, the differences between USCIS, the different types of applications in immigration court. Um, in some settings, you may be serving as an expert where you're submitting an actual affidavit, an expert opinion, and that's it, and there's no testimony. So some of this work is preemptive, where you are assuming that the adjudicator who is reading the application that, you're re that they're reviewing, that you've submitted, doesn't have that background um, in family violence and in intimate partner violence. And so you want to alleviate their concerns about why a person didn't leave or what intimate partner violence should look like by using the expert in that way. That's exactly right. And, and do you remember that case that we worked on together where we actually had to go back and um, ask for more information because um, there was little physical abuse in that particular case um, and they thought surely she couldn't be controlled if there was little physical abuse. And so I clearly had to write. And so this was a case where I was just writing. There wasn't going to be any direct testimony to a judge. And so I had to clearly state how you could be controlled without physical abuse. Do you yes. remember yes. that case? Yes, I do. And I think that's where it is important to, um, to sometimes preemptively think about, especially if you're doing immigration cases, um, where an expert would be valuable and whether you want to have that person present um, their information in the initial filing or if you are concerned follow up once immigration has requested some further evidence. That's right. So I just want to repeat what Edna said just so we're clear because I think that was a great um, point of clarity is in immigration cases sometimes you will appear um, in court um, sometimes you will be engaged and you'll be asked to write a report and then you'll appear in court and give direct testimony and sometimes that you'll just write a report that <clears throat> will be sent with a packet of information um, and your immigration attorney should be telling you what kind of immigration case you're working on. Sometimes they're, they have all, and Edna's going to go into those, and often I have to go back and ask, you know, is this a VAWA case, is this an asylum case, because those immigration laws are different. Did I get that right, Edna? You did, yes. Yeah. So you want to know what you're doing, but often immigration court does require some written documentation. Unlike criminal. Yes, they always do, yes. Yeah. yeah. Unlike criminal court, when I test, when I am engaged in criminal court, sometimes I can just show up in criminal court. I can have and be qualified and then testify. So, um, 
I'm just reading the question. How is the question when a victim is male and the abuser is female? What is the driving force, the actual abuse, or the immigration stress of the victim? <clears throat> so if I understand the question by Barbara, um, I don't think that um, the gender is uh, specified in immigration um, in the immigration status, um, but I'm going to let um, Ed answer that question. So I think anybody has the right for immigration provisions uh, regardless of gender. Is that right? Yes. So, um, and we'll be going into this a little bit more in detail when we talk about the specific forms of relief and how experts can fit in in, uh, in every kind of situation. But um, even though, you know, some of the laws may be called like the Violence Against Women, uh, Violence Against Women's Act or, um, I mean, that one in particular, it's not really gender-based. The idea is whether you qualify under those immigration laws as a victim of a violent crime, as a victim of intimate partner violence, as a victim of sexual assault, as a victim of human trafficking. So there are gender-neutral gender laws, and I think that is an important point to bring up in terms of how experts can fit in as well, too, because there is a preconceived notion that um, intimate partner violence occurs um, the, uh, with, with only women being victims or survivors. Um, and we all know that that's not the case, although in the majority of the, uh, the, the uh, intimate partner violence cases we do see there are women who are the victims. Um, there are also men who suffer from intimate partner violence, from uh, family violence, and from uh, sexual assault. And so that's where an expert can actually come in um, and clarify that as well too, especially if the adjudicator is thinking that if this is a, a man, then he's never going to be a victim. Right. And Marilyn, I see your question, and we're going to come back to the different types of immigration relief, um, and Edna will cover that. Um, we were talking about the different types of immigration relief, and I'm going to let Edna cover that in her slides. Um, so I want to talk about the second element, just from my perspective, that it's up here on the slide. This, the, one of the things that I try to do as an expert is really point my analysis to power and control. Um, and the cycle of violence. Now, I know there is uh, still controversy in the field around the cycle of violence. <clears throat> and um, again, in the context of court, I still find the cycle of violence really useful. I might not use it clinically, um, but I find it useful to help people understand how uh, a smart person might be victimized in a relationship. So I'm actually pointing to the offender's behavior that is m manipulative, um, where there is um, manipulation through the honeymoon, the tension building phases to keep the <clears throat> victim engaged in that relationship in my report. And I often talk about that in my direct testimony when I'm giving that in immigration, too. Um, the other reason I use this, too, is because um, although it's controversial, Walker's work is also considered classic in the DV world. And I know Lenore Walker has um, modified some of her work, and so you could include that. You would want to include, um, Again, as you talk from uh, a very strong perspective of um, whatever you know is evidence, your practice wisdom, the number of clients you've seen, the trends that you've seen, the books that you've read, the literature that you've read, um, you speak from that place of professional opinion use what makes sense to you so that when you are talking about it either in the perspective of a written report or you're on the stand talking about it, um, you can speak with some authority. Um, and so I give you just Lenore Walker's uh, opinion here because often it is uh, uh, in, in tricky cases, um, for me it has been incredibly successful as a theoretical base in which juries and judges, again, you won't have a jury in an immigration case, but uh, they can hang their hat on why somebody would, for a better, for um, a lack of a better word, get trapped in a situation of abuse. This, this begs the question of why she didn't leave. Again, 
when I'm giving direct testimony, I always point to the offender's behavior as opposed to um, the survivors. Um, <clears throat> so in my analysis around power and control, what I try to do here um, also is give a broad definition of what domestic violence is. So it is not about physical violence, but it's about gaining power and control. And power and control looks like these strategies, physical violence, financial control, isolation. It's a, about those things. And if you can shift the narrative in court or in your report to then give examples of the way the offender behaved, um, then you can make a convincing argument that indeed this relationship was abusive. Because ultimately, an expert's opinion will lead to the court to that conclusion. Sorry, I'm, gonna, <clears throat> I'm suffering a little bit with a cold here. I'm going to let um, Edna um, come back to the question about the U visa, because that's um, specifically around immigration. Um, OK, so how? Um, we might differentiate DV cases from uh, immigration cases um, that involve, um, I'm sorry, cases, um, immigration cases where there's DV. Um, and I think we all know these um, from sort of our practice wisdom, but you would, when you're interviewing the woman or you're looking at the documents, you would look for these cues. Um, these have been my experience in preparing my cases all, uh, almost always. Um, <clears throat> threats to be um, deported without their children, threats to turn into immigration. Again, when I think about the question, why didn't she leave, um, most of the survivors that I'm engaged with will say, I couldn't leave because I knew I'd never see my kids again. And so I am writing that in the report. Um, specifically. <clears throat> so as I'm talking, I'm going to let you read um, through this um, case example. Um, and actually, I think this was the case we were just talking about um, that we mentioned. Um, in this case, um, there was a lack of, um, generally a lack of physical abuse. But what happened in this case was a complete dependency. Um, a, comp a, a real isolation of this woman um, who had come over and married her uh, U.S. citizen husband. And what happened really was um, him demoralizing her. Instead of this adult-adult relationship, which is part of a healthy uh, marriage, there was this parent-child relationship. And this played out in all sorts of ways. When I interviewed her, it played out from her not having um, feminine products, tampons, um, and she didn't know how to get them because she had no access to money. She didn't have access to their bank accounts. She didn't have access to getting a job. Um, and so there was not shared power in this relationship. Um, she also was completely isolated. and. Um, he would tell her things like she couldn't call her, her family in her home country. So although there wasn't a lot of physical violence, there was almost none, it was easy to point the court towards the power and control issues. Um, but that had to be said explicitly because if you had met this woman, you would have otherwise thought she was very competent. Um, because she was articulate, she was college educated, um, <clears throat> so it would have been easy to miss how controlled she was, um, how isolated she was, and ultimately how um, abused she was. Um, <clears throat> what was really important also in this case, um, eventually what happened for her was she got a job uh, babysitting, so she was making a lot of money under the table, and um, we were, you know, part of what my job was to, to help the court understand that 
just because she was sort of able to dig deep down and be resilient didn't mean that she was less abused. And so as an expert, it was really important for me to tease that out because this was a case I was not going to provide direct testimony in. I was just going to provide a written documentation. So I worked really hard on how I wanted my report to look to help uh, the adjudicator understand or hang his or her hat on a theory um, of what I know for my expertise, if that made sense. All right, so what other things that might be different in immigration cases? Um, I alluded to this. I think in every single case that I've had, um, and I don't know how many cases I've done for immigration court, but probably 60% at least of my cases have been immigration cases because they are the best feel-good cases you could ever be involved in as um, an expert witness. <clears throat> it might be more. It might be 75%. All of the immigration cases that I do are pro bono cases um, because I happen to sit in a position uh, in my job that I can do those pro bono. So I try to take these more frequently than I take other cases. Um, but in almost all these cases, I'm interviewing the client. Um, and so you need to consider that when taking these cases. Um, the great thing about these cases, from my perspective, is there's a lot of documentation that can be reviewed. Um, usually the client has already given an extensive affidavit in history, um, and so that's really useful um, to their lawyer. Um, so, and that's a bit, almost always it's available to you. Um, and also um, when the uh, client, when the uh, immigrant survivor is um, suffering from um, some trauma symptoms, you can also ask the lawyer to engage other professionals, which has been critically important in some of the cases. Now, this is really different in criminal cases where you might not want to have a psychosocial assessment done. You might not want to know if there is um, <clears throat> PTSD um, because it might be used against the survivor in criminal cases. Um, it might be uh, turned around and twisted into pathology. Um, in these cases, it often is can show that there was trauma, past trauma. Um, so you don't want to make that um, decision lightly, um, but often it's been very helpful for a psychologist or a social worker, a clinical social worker, to do some testing with clients and or with their children and for me to have those reports and incorporate those reports um, into to my written documents. Okay, <clears throat> I think maybe I've got just a couple more slides and I want to turn it over because Edna's got a lot of great information. Um, the other two things, um, two other pieces that are also different in uh, immigration cases than other DVA cases is that the issue around extreme hardship. Um, <clears throat> and what this really talks about is um, you know, what's going to happen if there's continued violence? Um, the way I get at this issue is during that interview, I usually ask the client um, or survivor, um, where did he or she go for help and what happened when they went for help, formal help or informal help? Um, and so I'm actually able to build on you know, if we don't give them this family some relief, what is going to happen to them if we don't give them some immigration relief? What I'm really careful about not doing is being a country expert. So um, I'm not a country expert in this case on Guatemala. I'm not a country expert in any other country except I'm not even probably an expert in the U.S. Um, so. But what I can do is describe generally how um, this 
survivor tried to reach out for help or felt they couldn't reach out for help. So I can get that from the psychosocial assessment. The other issue then is around extreme cruelty. Um, and this is the literature I use around extreme cruelty. And I try to, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, uh, tie this back to, um, you know, what happens if we um, don't help this family? Okay. And then I think we've talked about this. Um, reports to the court, um, if you can be, um, add specifically culturally relevant research and data, it helps. If you guys struggle with some of that, um, you know, let us know where we try to keep tabs on some of the research that's out there. Um, and let's see, let me just look at my notes. Oh, I know what I wanted to say um, about uh, one more note I wanted to say, and then I think I'm going to turn it over to Edna um, around extreme cruelty. My experience with um, cases of immigration is the way that they vary is they are um, seem to have histories of some of the most violent, interpersonal violence that I have seen in my career. Um, so when women come in, um, they have extreme complex PTSD and have suffered extreme physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their partner and <clears throat> have been motivated to leave and come to the U.S., flee to the U.S. often because of the violence. And in more recent years have left without their children. Um, which I think is a phenomenon that we really need to look at closely. And so when I'm talking about in that previous slide extreme cruelty, I really tried to dig deep and help the court understand that piece from that particular issue. Okay, I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Edna. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to start um, by going over essentially the, the immigration structure because I think it helps individuals, especially if you all are planning on trying to testify as experts in these types of cases, to understand the actual structure and the end goal for the individual um, and in their case. Um, and that will help you to structure and understand what you want to put into your uh, expert opinion. So I'm going to go through that and how experts fit into that system and then go through specific immigration case types, such as the Violence Against Women Act, um, U visas, T visas, and asylum in particular. I know there have been some questions about some of that, so we'll cover that um, more in terms of giving you a general overview, but also understanding how, as an expert in certain areas, you may be able to fit into that case and what you can do to assist the individual. So the path to citizenship that you see up here, I put up primarily because I think most people who don't practice immigration law just assume that people come to the United States and they apply to become U.S. citizens. And to become a U.S. citizen is actually a very lengthy process if you're not actually born in the United States or if you can't derive your citizenship from your parents who were born in the United States. So there are three main ways to become what is known as a legal permanent resident, which is uh, someone who has a green card who has uh, immigrated permanently to the United States. So there's a family-based system through a spouse or a parent or an adult child. There's an employment-based system where companies can apply for certain workers to come on visas and then receive their lawful permanent residency after a number of years. And then there's a side which I call the humanitarian side. And that is where a lot of the work with uh, victims of violent crimes, victims of trafficking, um, and victims of intimate partner violence kind of uh, hang their hat in order to get their green card. And those are individuals applying for U visas as victims of crime, asylum, or relief under VAWA. Once they receive their lawful permanent residency, individuals can apply to become a U.S. citizen, but that only occurs after three or five years and if they can pass an exam and do all of uh, the things that are necessary to become a U.S. citizen. Where you're helping individuals is not to become a U.S. citizen. Most times when you're uh, working as an expert in these cases, it's because you are helping them apply for um, the humanitarian relief first, U visa, VAWA, 
uh, asylum, for example, which will then lead to their lawful permanent residency. So there's lots of tiers of different steps, that, lots of different tiers that individuals have to go through in order to get, first of all, some sort of humanitarian relief, then their green card, and then eventually their citizenship if they want. And so I think it's important to make those kinds of dis uh, distinctions. The structure that I showed you before on how to become a U.S. citizen is really um, done under this whole federal immigration structure, which is under the umbrella of DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security. And there are three sections under the Department of Homeland Security. Um, two of them are enforcement sections, and that's ICE and CBP, so Immigration and Customs Enforcement and um, Customs and Border Patrol. So those are the individuals, when you're coming back from an international trip, um, that do inspections, uh, look through your passport, make sure you're a citizen, you have a visa. They are the ones who enforce the immigration laws. USCIS is different. They're an application center. So if you want to apply for a benefit, like a visa to come to the United States, or if you want to apply for humanitarian relief, or you want to apply for your family member, you, you submit that application to USCIS. So when you are testifying as an expert in written form um, for some sort of humanitarian relief, you are submitting that form to USCIS um, through the attorney that you're working with. If you are testifying in court, it is because the individual that you are helping has encountered one of the enforcement agencies um, of the Department of Homeland Security. So either CBP or more often ICE. Um, and they have been placed in what's known as removal proceedings or deportation proceedings, where the government attorneys, who are the ICE attorneys, are alleging that the person um, is not eligible to remain in the United States. The person can then apply for other types of humanitarian relief, including ones that you could just apply to before USCIS, um, such as something like VAWA um, or asylum, in order to stop that deportation by saying that they have some sort of uh, manner in which they could stay here. So when you're before the immigration court, you are testifying in a court. And what I want to jump back to um, is this slide where we talked about the Dobert standard and the federal rules of evidence. So if you're applying uh, or if you are actually an expert within a uh, within a court that is not immigration court, you are governed under the federal rules of evidence. If you're in federal court um, testifying as an expert, and there are some very strict rules that are laid out uh, for that, which talks about who an expert is and who can become an expert. This standard, however, um, the Board of Immigration Appeals and some of the circuit courts have found may be too strict for immigration court because immigration court or immigration proceedings are considered administrative proceedings. So they are, fed, they are court proceedings, but it is known as an administrative court. There are relaxed rules of evidence. There's no depositions. Things are very different in immigration court because they're administrative proceedings versus as if you were in federal court. So there's no ironclad requirement that you have to be an academic, that you have to be um, someone who's published a number of books or articles um, in the precise subject matter in which you're testifying. I'm not saying that that doesn't help, and if you have done that, it makes qualifying you as an expert much easier, but if you are an advocate who has had decades of experience in working with domestic violence victims, that might be enough to be able to qualify you as an expert on intimate partner violence or on family violence. Um, it does make it a little more difficult, but there's no ironclad rule. The idea is to look at your history, um, what your education is, what your work history is, and what you have done throughout your career to develop your expertise in an area. So I wanted to make sure that we covered that um, just so people uh, know that what you may have experienced as an expert in other cases might not be the same in immigration court um, because of that. Let's see if I went back to the... Okay. Um, in immigration court also, Noel mentioned this as well, there's only one person that you're trying to convince, and that is an immigration judge. There's no jury. Um, it's the same when you're applying for a relief before USCIS. You are applying for relief before one adjudicator who will review your application. There's always an appeal process before USCIS and before the immigration court, but it's always better to not, in my opinion, it's better to not um, rely on going through an appeal process, but instead trying to convince the one person who is adjudicating your application or your case um, to go forward and decide for your client. Um, it is a civil court proceeding, which means there are no court-appointed lawyers for individuals who are facing deportation proceedings or uh, who are facing deportation. So they have to find help through a nonprofit for free legal services or they have to hire their own private attorneys. Okay, 
So affirmative versus defensive applications is a little bit more of what I was talking about before. Affirmative applications are ones where only immigration makes decisions on them. The person is not in immigration deportation proceedings. They can be sometimes, but there are certain applications where you can only file um, to USCIS, and you're asking USCIS to give you a benefit. So examples would be if you're applying for a spouse or your son or daughter to come to the United States on some sort of family petition. Um, if you are applying as a valid self-petitioner, or if you are an asylum seeker who's come to the United States and who hasn't been stopped and detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and you're seeking asylum, you would apply affirmatively with USCIS, where an adjudicator would look at your application, look at all the paper that you have submitted, sometimes set an appointment in which you yourself as the applicant can go forward and give information. When you have those interviews, um, experts can't come into those interviews to give their opinions orally. Everything has to be written. The application must be submitted um, in paper format. And that's what Noelle was talking about before when she was talking about the details within her expert um, reports and the work that she puts into them. Because the more work that you put into them and the more precise they are and the more that you can explain the exact point that you're trying to get across, the better it is for the applicant in the end. Defensive applications are ones that you are putting forth before the immigration court in which you're saying, um, I know that I am in deportation proceedings, but I am eligible to remain in the United States because I'm applying for asylum. I have been victimized in my home country or persecuted in my home country, or I'm applying for cancellation of removal under the Violence Against Women Act, or I'm applying for some sort of waiver. Um, and in those cases, if you're an expert, um, in a defensive application, you will submit a, still a detailed written um, report, but you will also be asked more likely um, than not to testify in front of the immigration judge. If you are asked to uh, be an expert witness in immigration court, I find that it's really helpful for experts to go and read the immigration court practice manual. You don't have to read it all. There's a lot of stuff that does not apply to you at all. Um, but it does give a good overview of the technicalities of immigration court, and it does have a section that's very clearly um, written out about what experts must do um, and what the attorney must do in order to ensure that experts are allowed um, to testify in court. The first is that experts must provide a written report. So unlike in, if you are in a criminal case or any type of civil case in which there may be a deposition instead and you don't have to provide a written report, um, and I know in some cases you do have to that, uh, provide a written report and your findings there, but um, in immigration court it is a must. If you don't have a written report, you will not be able to, um, to testify. The attorney that you're working with also needs to provide your name and information on a witness list, where they list your, your name, um, a summary of the testimony, the estimated length of testimony, the language in which um, you will testify, and your CV or resume if you are testifying as an expert. And so that is laying the basis to qualify you as an expert and letting the court know that there will be expert testimony um, in this particular case. Um, in immigration court, you should uh, expect to have your testimony be given live. In some instances, they do allow telephonic testimony, but that is something that the court has grown to uh, frown upon more and more. Uh, there are, as I said before, relaxed rules of evidence in immigration court because it's an administrative proceeding. So things where if you've worked with other attorneys in other court cases where they talk about hearsay or they talk about specific rules um, in terms of you uh, testifying will not, more, more often than not, will not apply in immigration court. Um, I usually prep the experts that I work with when we're going to court as to exactly what's going to happen. So here is a direct examination. Here are some sample questions that I am going to give you. This is how I'm going to qualify you as an expert. Um, I am going to ask you a little bit about the theory of the case. And I don't say that because I want the expert to actually t state to the judge, here is the theory of the case. I say that so the person who's testifying as an expert has an idea of what I want to put forward to this judge and where their expertise falls in line with my entire theory of my case in order to assist me, number one, in order to, to make sure that the expert knows exactly where their testimony fits in. And then I tell them I'm going to ask for an explanation of findings and how they relate to that case theory. So that's how that key piece uh, fits in. 
So I do a practice run through. I send some sample questions with the caveat that you know some of these might change um, when we actually go to court, but you should review it, review your report that you've written, um, and be prepared to kind of put forward your expertise, your CV, and your history as well. Um, as long with your, along with your findings and how you came to those findings, obviously. Um, and then we do a mini cross-examination where we'll talk about what I think that the trial attorney might uh, bring forward in a cross-examination. And I think this is really important to do. I think if you're working with an, ex or if you're working with an immigration attorney, it's something that you might want to um, ask them about, ask them about sample questions that they've had in other cases from trial attorneys. I will say that, um, and Noelle can talk a little bit uh, about this because I think that she has a lot of experience doing um, the testimony in court, but um, most of the trial attorneys don't ask very many cross-examination cases, or cross-examination questions, I'm sorry. Noelle, what has been your experience when, you have, uh, when you've done some testimony for me, for the immigration clinic, and for some other folks? Yeah, that's true. I would say, um, uh, so I want to be careful about saying this. I would say that immigration cases are complex in a lot of ways, but they're also great cases to um, build some confidence about doing direct testimony because I find that the, the cross-examination is a lot less uh, combative than in criminal court. Um, so, and I think that's because people are less prepared. Um, yeah. the, you know, the opposing counsel, the government a counsel is less prepared. So I've actually been in situations where I've been asked no questions. Um, and then I've been in situations where they start to ask questions and they realize that I know a whole lot more and they just stop asking questions. The other thing that I think happens, and, and I think that would be true for most, anybody who's been working in the field. Um, I do think that there's finesse on the stand, so you don't want to come off as, and this is what we do in our national training, you want to come off as smart, articulate, not a know-it-all, uh, because there are all, always alternative explanations, so you want to admit those, um, but, and then wait for redirect so you can say, yes, but but I believe in my professional opinion it is X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, this person was abused, basically, is, is why you're testifying in this case. Um, but the other thing I was going to say, too, is often when uh, the government lawyer won't ask questions, the judge will ask a lot of questions. And my experience with that is that the judge is actually trying to um, establish the record. It, would that be a right way to say that, Edna? Um, so when yeah. we've gotten the opinion, actually a lot of what the judge has put in his or her record is actually cutting and pasting from exactly my testimony. Um, and I'm not saying that as because I think I'm, you know, um, a brilliant expert. I think w just giving the judge a way to think about um, the intimate partner violence helps the judge make an opinion favorable to the battered immigrants. Right. And I think what it also does, and this is, I think, a good thing that Noelle does and what I would encourage people who are going to try and become experts in these cases, is she hangs a lot of her uh, conclusions on well-founded research, on well-founded research that she's done, well-founded research that in the field in general. And I think it makes it easier than in these cases for judges to be able to do what Noelle is talking about, ask those specific questions on the record, and then use parts of her answer in their actual decision to justify why they ruled one way or another. And so it's something that um, I do think is really important. And let me just um, say how I do that, um, because I don't think you have to be a researcher. I am a researcher, but I don't think you have to be a researcher to do that. I think you can, you use phrases like, this is consistent with the research that is in the field, and you pick research that you would go to. And some of the best research actually is research that would be, for example, um, at Vonnet. V A W N E T dot org, and that's research that actually is written that is uh, co consumable. So it's not the stuff that's out in databases that we don't know. Thank you, Sue O, for writing that up there. 
um, and and have those sites in your documentation. Um, so that's how you sort of uh, firm up your opinion is grounded in the research that we know is out there. So. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with uh, with Noel. You don't have to be a researcher in order to 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 be an expert, but relying on that vast amount of research and history that uh, that's already out there in the field is really uh, helpful in terms of placing within your report. Um, that being said, um, as I said before, there's no formal discovery in immigration proceedings and there's no depositions. So what I submit for my clients in a particular case, that is what is in the record. And immigration may have a record on my client or may, they may not, depending. Um, so the, the, there's no other, there's no discovery in which I ask for documents from uh, immigration. I can ask for documents through a Freedom of Information Act request if they've had other applications and other things pending, um, but immigration doesn't allow for any type of formal discovery. Um, there are no depositions, as I said before, um, so it's important to know that your, what, what, your, what is in your written affidavit, because that is what the trial attorney will use to try and impeach you. And so, um, as Noelle was saying, a lot of the trial attorneys aren't as prepared um, sometimes when it comes to the final hearings. That is not because they are bad attorneys. That is actually because um, they have a very set schedule in which they have to go through a number of cases within a day. Um, you know, the, they go through hundreds and hundreds of cases within a day, um, and they get a file in the morning and they're told to review it um, and that they're going to be proceeding on an actual case. And so um, they're reviewing it as best they can. But I will say that one of the things that they always review when they get a file is the expert uh, opinion. And if it's well written and well documented, then you are less likely to get um, cross-examination questions um, about it. And if you know your expert opinion, your affidavit well, um, then you're, you're less likely to have um, moments where the government attorney will try and impeach you using, um, using your own words. Um, the other thing is, is that sometimes government attorneys may find other studies in your field that have findings that are opposite of, of what you have found. And so to be prepared for that, to understand where there are findings that are different than yours and how that might affect um, your outcome if it is brought up as well too, because sometimes that does happen. Um, I do see that there were some questions about lawful permanent residency, how long you had to have your lawful permanent residency before becoming a U.S. citizen. I don't want to delve too deeply into some of the more technicalities of um, immigration cases. I will say the general rule is five years. Um, there are some limited instances um, in which an individual can, uh, can become a U.S. citizen after three years of their lawful permanent residency, and that is if they are married to a U.S. citizen, and that U.S. citizen is the person that petitioned them through the family process, or if they are um, uh, someone who has re received relief under VAWA, and their relief under VAWA was through an abusive U.S. citizen spouse. So there are some, those are some general things as well, too. Um, if you have specific questions about those, I mean, it's really better to talk to an immigration advocate or attorney um, to talk about specific cases and the rule for uh, getting your, your citizenship. Um, what I want to move into now is some discussion about the various types of humanitarian relief in which experts can be useful. And humanitarian relief, uh, specifically as it relates to victims or survivors of family violence, um, survivors of violent crimes, and survivors of human trafficking, as well as um, uh, asylum seekers who are also survivors of intimate partner violence and how that kind of plays um, in with expert testimony. So I'm going to cover VAWA and cancellation of removal together. Um, VAWA is a form of relief that you apply for before the U.S. Uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, before the service. Um, cancellation of removal is very similar to VAWA. It's called VAWA cancellation of removal. It's all together. It is something that you apply for before the immigration judge because you have been stopped by ICE and placed into deportation proceedings. They're based in very similar kind of theories of individuals who are married to um, the children of or the parents of adult U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. You have to show a family connection to a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident. You have to show, a lawful permanent resident. You have to show that you're a child or a spouse, um, or that if you are um, saying that you are a victim of elder abuse, that you are the uh, a, 
the parent of an adult U.S. citizen child, I'm sorry, not lawful permanent resident, just U.S. citizen child, that you were battered or subject to extreme cruelty. Um, if it's a marriage relationship that you entered into a good faith marriage, so you married for something other than immigration relief, that you have a shared residence, that you're a person of good moral character, um, and then for the cancellation of removal, there are some additional things where you have to show that you've continuously resided in the U.S. for three years. Um, it would be an extreme hardship to yourself, your child, or your parent um, if you, uh, child or parent who are U.S. citizens uh, or lawful permanent residents, um, if you were removed from the U.S. And both of these types of relief can lead to lawful permanent residency. I'm not going to go over the specifics of them because I don't really think that that's what this webinar is for, but instead talk about where I think an expert fits in within the specific model, the specific case. Um, and really, it's this idea of battered or subject to extreme cruelty. Um, and the idea is, I mean, we all know what battery is, and so I don't think that there is much more that needs to be said about that, but there's this other idea of extreme cruelty, which I think is a much op more, um, it's an idea of what intimate partner violence is, what family violence is that is outside the realm of, for those of us who practice doing protective orders or in criminal cases, that's outside those narrow realms within the justice system that we consider uh, or that may be considered family violence cases for court proceedings. So extreme cruelty um, can include um, economic abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, threats of uh, threats of any of those types of uh, abuse. Um, and the standard is an any credible evidence standard, which is a fairly low standard, and it's also a subjective one, where it looks at the person who's applying and how the abuse that they've suffered has actually affected them. And so this is where I think an expert affidavit really comes in um, to play, and it can be really key, especially in those cases um, where there is not as much physical abuse, there aren't a lot of police reports, you know, it, there aren't uh, any reports of hospitalizations due to assaults. Things where people who don't have a history in uh, working with family violence victims might not understand why this person should be considered a victim or a survivor of uh, extreme cruelty. And so I think that's where the expertise comes in. And when I'm working with someone in preparing one of these cases, where, whether it be before immigration service or before the immigration court, I lay out this idea of this is what I want to present in terms of extreme cruelty. What do you and your expertise think? Do you think that this contains power and control? Do you think that this is a, a case in which um, you could really argue that this person can't leave a relationship or that they are a victim of family violence? And so that's what um, that's where the expert uh, testimony is used in those types of cases. Um, and the case that Noelle was talking about before that some of the um, opinions came from was a case that I worked on, and it was a VAWA case where the individual was married to a U.S. citizen, and there was a lot of neglect, there was a lot of isolation, there was a lot of economic abuse, but there was very little to no physical abuse. And so immigration was thinking of denying the case because of that, because they didn't think that it was family violence, they didn't think that it was power of control. And the use of the expert affidavit was really what changed uh, their mind when Noel explained um, the dynamics of power control and explained what extreme cr and cruelty can encompass. Okay. Um, I am going to uh, talk about U and T visas next. Um, so U visas are for victims of violent crimes, and T visas are, vict uh, are visas for victims of human trafficking. These two types of visas are only applied for before the Immigration Service. The Immigration Court cannot adjudicate these cases. So you may have a person who is before the Immigration Court, and you may be assisting them um, as an expert in a U or T visa case with an affidavit, but you will not yourself go before court because the only people who can adjudicate these cases are um, the individuals in the Immigration Service um, in USCIS. So U visas are for victims of crime, for individuals who have suffered substantial physical or mental abuse due to that crime. They've reported the crime, so they've been helpful in the detection, investigation, or prosecution of the crime, and they received a certification to that, um, to that effect. And then the application is submitted to USCIS. 
um, the way that I use experts in this is not to talk about, you know, what family violence is or what domestic violence is, but in order to show that this person has actually suffered substantial physical or mental abuse due to the crime. And so these are individuals, the experts that I use are individuals who maybe have a history of doing counseling, who are individuals that can do testing for um, PTSD or, or other types of trauma and um, who aren't the actual people who are giving therapeutic or counseling services to an individual, but who instead are meeting with the individual in order to give an assessment. Um, and so I think that's an important distinction to make as well. Um, and that's where I use experts in that type of case. Um, for T visa cases, those are for individuals who are victims of, of a severe form of human trafficking. Um, and they have to show that they uh, want to remain in the United States. They've reported the trafficking um, and they can't leave the United States and go back to their home country because it would result in extreme hardship involving unusual and severe harm. They also must show that they, can, they have complied with all the reasonable requests of law enforcement um, unless the trauma from the trafficking prevents them from doing so. And that's kind of the key for the trafficking cases. I will say I use um, experts less in trafficking cases and in U visa cases um, just because of the nature of the crimes that are classified under these types of cases. Um, for U visa cases, it's not just emotional abuse. Um, or emotional harm or psychological abuse or economic abuse. It is something that is qualified as a crime under the, 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 penal, and under the penal code in the, in the state that you are residing in, that, it's, that it is a criminal activity that is um, being investigated by law enforcement and or prosecuted um, by law, law enforcement. And so it does fit into that more traditional model. And it doesn't have to be just family violence. This is also sexual assault, kidnapping, um, sexual assault of a minor, there's a number of different crimes that fit in that category. For T visas, the, um, the crime itself is trafficking, which is labor plus forced fraud and coercion. And so we're talking about an individual that's been forced into a labor situation or forced into, um, a, the, forced into a sex trade um, against their will. And so they've reported it to law enforcement. And where I use an expert is if that individual does not want to assist law enforcement. It's been reported and they're so traumatized that they can't actually go forward and assist in some sort of um, request from law enforcement to give testimony or to give other types of um, assistance. So that's generally uh, U and T visas. I will say the vast majority of the cases that I do don't, of those types don't involve experts as much, but there are times when, um, when it is necessary. Um, I'm gonna talk next about asylum, withholding of removal and relief un under the Convention Against Torture. But before um, I do that, Sue, is, were there any questions on some of the other forms of relief or things before um, that people had that maybe um, Noelle and I could answer before we move on? Well, there are questions, um, and it is hard to know whether or not there are how many we can do now. Um, let's see. There, there was a question, is it possible to be denied under the good moral character clause due to refusal to cooperate in the prosecution of the perpetrator? Okay, and I see that question from Karen. And so um, I think the issue, Karen, is that that's a hard question to answer the way that it's been framed. Because you can be denied for having a lack of good moral character, and you can also be denied, um, and I'm assuming you're talking about a U visa, for refusal to cooperate in prosecution of a perpetrator. But those aren't keys for VAWA cases. Again, if you're working with, I mean, I think the most important thing to take out of this webinar is, um, not only how to be an expert, but also how to work with an immigration attorney when you aren't fully understanding a case that you are assisting on. Um, and I will say, even if you are not assisting as an expert, but you are an advocate, advocating for a survivor, and you want to be able to ensure that you understand what's going on so you can also help to explain to someone that you're assisting, the, the, the survivor in this case, that is where communication with the attorney is really important um, and in getting some of these questions answered. So yes, you can get denied for those two separate things on various cases, but those are actually much more um, complicated questions, and I don't think they're really um, that we'll have enough time to cover them in, in this webinar. But if you are working with someone on that type of case, I would encourage you to talk to that immigration attorney or the BIA accredited rep and ask them for a um, more detailed answer in terms of that. 
So given the time, I would encourage you to go forth. And if we do have time at the end, um, we'll ask some more questions. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm almost done as well, too. So the next slide we're going to talk about, or the next form of relief, and really the last form of relief I'm going to talk about in terms of using experts opi expert opinions um, are asylum cases. And I use different types of experts in these types of cases. And so there are experts who are country conditions experts, which is what uh, Noelle had alluded to before in the past. So there are individuals who have um, a lot of expertise on a specific, specific specific region or a specific area or a specific country, and I ask them to provide their expertise in that. And then in very specific types of cases, um, and especially gender-based asylum cases, I do ask experts who are perhaps experts in domestic violence or intimate partner violence to give their opinion on the dynamics of family violence. Um, so asylum in general is when an individual can't return to their home country because the government is unwilling or unable to protect them or the government um, itself is persecuting that person based on one of five protected grounds, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, their race, or their membership in a particular social group. Individuals can apply for asylum before the Immigration Service. Um, so they have not been detained when they come to the United States. They come with a visa and they realize maybe they can't go back to their home country. And so they complete an asylum application and apply to an asylum office. Or they can apply defensively before the immigration judge. And those are individuals who may have come to the United States um, and stopped at the border and said, I can't return to my home country and I want protection. Um, they're placed in deportation proceedings where they can then apply for um, asylum stating that they are being persecuted or that they will be persecuted based on one of these five protected grounds. Um, when we talk about the cases that are gender-based cases, which is um, kind of the focus here in terms of family violence cases, we're talking about individuals who are persecuted because of their membership in a particular social group. So a particular social group for immigration purposes uh, means um, some sort of, that you are a part of a group in which you have a characteristic that a person, can, that you can't change about yourself. It doesn't matter because it's an innate characteristic um, that is visible um, and particular in some ways um, and that can't be changed. So for the gender-based cases, they're usually uh, the forced genital circumcision, forced marriage, family violence, uh, consequences of divorce or refusal to comply with gender norms, um, or LGBT cases. There are also certain cases based on um, um, persecution by individuals who are members of uh, gangs or narco-trafficking groups as well, too. And so um, I use experts in these cases. So we'll take the example of a family violence case where we have an individual who's come from a country who has a partner who is incredibly abusive. Um, the cases are all very specific. And so what you need to look at in general, what I look at as an immigration attorney is, what is this individual fleeing from? What are the conditions in that person's country? And um, is it, uh, are there conditions in which this would make a good asylum claim? And so you have to show that the government is unwilling or unable to help this person. Um, so if a woman is fleeing domestic violence and it's very clear that there are no anti-domestic violence laws in that country, it might be an asylum claim. The persecution that they suffered from their partner, you have to show that that persecution is linked somehow to their membership in a particular social group. And for family violence cases, the idea is, is that the relationship itself is um, a faulted one because it is one based on violence in which that person can't leave. They can't freely leave that relationship and because of that, so there are two things at um, contest here. There is the laws in that person's home country that won't protect them, and two, um, the idea of what family violence is in that home country, um, why there are no laws, because perhaps family violence is not considered a crime or it's not considered something where the government wants to intervene because it's considered a, you know, a family issue or something like that. Um, and so a normal consensual relationship then becomes something that is um, in a, a relationship that a person can't leave. They, can't they can divorce the person, but it doesn't matter. Or they can leave the home and say, I am not going to go back to you, um, but it doesn't matter because that person will continue to persecute them, will continue to seek them out, um, and their government won't be able to protect them. So when Noelle has helped me in these cases, I, talk, I have her talk more about in her um, in her expert testimony, this idea of what, a fa what is family violence? Why can't a person leave? And when a person does try to leave, is there increased risk? 
Why is there increased risk? Um, in order to explain to the judge um, or the immigration officer who's evaluating the case um, what the actual nature of that relationship is, because that nature of that relationship um, is what is the social group. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, and so uh, I will move on from there, and if, just to leave some time for some questions at the end, a few minutes, and talk about, well, I actually have uh, Noelle talk about this, because I mean, she's, she's the one who actually writes the written report, so it's probably better for her to give the, the general guidelines. Um, well, I just want to say that I have, um, I think I have a redacted report or two that I'd be glad to share with the group. Uh, um, I think we finally came to the conclusion, Toby Myers and I, who is also a nationally recognized expert, we kind of hold each other up through these processes, um, decided we could give out our reports. We had some wor worries and concerns about doing that, but they are part of court documents. Um, but here are some ideas about writing the reports. Um, <clears throat> so, and I think I've talked a lot about a lot of them, but what I will say is using the client's words and phrases I think helps a lot. Um, so if you are going to try to dispel how it wasn't um, sort of towards the power and control, you know, if if the client or um, survivor says, you know, I, I made the decision to leave because he was going to kill me, I mean, I think I always use quotes or phrases like that. Um, so these are just some of my um, issues. And I wrote in here discovery issues, but now I'm not, I'm wondering why I wrote that in this particular one. I think actually that might have been for my um, criminal cases, because in criminal cases you have to be so careful about discovery issues. Um, but as Edna said, that that's, um, it's not the same kind of record keeping um, and communications that are discoverable um, here. So I think that might be it. I know there are lots of, whoops, lots of questions, so, um, do we want to open it up now? Sure. Let me. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good idea. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Edna. Uh, this is Sue. No. Uh, it's. I mean, there are definitely a bunch of immigration questions, and so it, it's clear that there's, you know, it's it's just the complex world of immigration law process and proceedings is something that I'm always, always grateful to have people like Edna and Noel negotiate them for us. So I really want to thank you, smart people, for knowing this stuff. And Cecilia in particular, I know you had a number of questions. Um, you know, there, I, I think what Edna was suggesting is that you really do try to locate an immigration attorney to talk with. Um, and if you can't locate one in your community, we can help try to connect you with uh, one or someone. Um, but one of the questions that is more about expert uh, testimony in these kind of cases, um, I, Linda said that she, she had a hard time hearing a piece. And I think it was this question of um, really who, who is a good expert? And if you have a client, a woman, a survivor that you're working with who is seeing a psychologist or a therapist who's treating that person in some way, um, would you want that person to serve as an expert? And so why or why not? Um, so this is Edna. And I actually don't use as an expert a treating therapist or a psychologist. And the reason is um, because my understanding and from what I have been told from therapists who have worked with uh, clients who I've kind of asked this question to is that there might be a conflict of interest. While there's no discovery in immigration cases, once you get on the stand to provide an assessment and provide information about someone you're treating, um, I think that there may be um, some issues in divulging other parts of the treatment or other parts of you know, whatever you've talked about in normal therapy um, going, going through the whole process um, that might uh, not be appropriate for immigration uh, court, or but that might be open then for people to ask about. And so that has been my understanding. I don't know if Noel, you have a different opinion. Um, yeah, I think that's ex I think that's exactly right. I think you can use a psychologist, but maybe not the person who is seeing the person in therapy. 
so um, if that differentiation is made, because I, I think it gets very tricky, and and I think most psychologists or clinical social workers would actually decline being an expert in that case. Yeah. Uh, Linda just posted. Yeah, that's been my. Oh, sorry. Linda just posted that they use therapist letters as support letters, but not as experts. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I I can't believe that we're already at um, almost 4.30 Eastern time. Uh, I mean, there's such a wealth of information, and there's so much more. I feel like we might I, – I say this every time we do a webinar, but I feel like there should be a part two. Uh, and maybe we can convince our excellent speakers to – consider that because I, I do think there's lots of important issues that came up today that we could go into much further depth on. And, you know, I really appreciate Noel and Anna you saying, like, there are some things that are similar to other kinds of cases, but there's a lot of things that are really different. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're really talking about really knowing what it is you're going for, what the goal and purpose of the expert testimony is, and what may work in one case. Even one immigration case may not work in another immigration case, and what may work in civil or criminal case may not work in an immigration case. So I think that's a, just a really important framing, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sorry to those of you whose questions we weren't able to get to. Um, I will send this chat on to Noel and uh, Edna, and they've been looking at it throughout anyway. Um, we will gather some information from Edna and Noel, and I will get that information back to you guys. Uh, and Noelle, I'm just wondering whether or not you have an, I should have, I should know the answer to this before I'm asking the question, but um, if you have a list of some of the research and citations that are included in the PowerPoint. Uh, um, I do, and actually I think probably in that redacted, um, if I send you the redacted report that I have, I think in my bibliography probably those cases are cited. That's great. And so another, I will send that to you. And there was another question about whether or not um, either of you have sample written documents that you sent on to uh, USCIS. Um, and so the, we can talk a little bit more about that. Any information we get from the presenters, I will send to you participants. I really want to thank you all. Um, and in the interest of time, we are going to end. And Edna and Noel, thank you so much for the wealth of information. And if you have any closing remarks would you, that you want to share with the participants, now's the time to do it. Um, no, I just want to say thank you and um, get on a case. We, we need you all to get on a case. And Edna? I second that. I second that. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for all the great work you do, and thank you all for participating. Uh, please, I'm going to remind you to do that short evaluation, that uh, questionnaire will pop up right when you get out of this webinar, and we'll also send it to you in a half an hour so you can choose when you want to do it. Um, and thank you all, and I will copy out this chat for you, Noel and uh, Edna, so you can have all the questions. Okay? Great. So thank all right, bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Okay.